Amen. Praise the word this morning. Praise Amen. the Lord. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful time around your word, the awesome privilege and wonderful opportunity to receive the uncompromised word of the Lord Jesus Christ. The son of the living God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the sustainer of all men. We thank you for the creator living in our hearts by faith, Christ in us, the hope of glory. We thank you that you have given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge, through the knowledge, through the knowledge of what it means to be in Christ Jesus. We thank you that through this divine nature we have been partakers of the promises of God, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We thank you that you have raised us up to sit in heavenly places. You've all blessed us in heavenly places which are always in Christ Jesus. We thank you for perception. We thank you for opening our under minds that we might comprehend and understand the scriptures. For they all point to Jesus and what it means to be in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit, who is the teacher of the church, the Savior, the, who leads the church and brings all things to our remembrance. We thank you, Lord, for your love, your grace, your favor that you've given to each one of us this measure of faith. And through that faith, we become righteous with you, right with you, because we are right with you based upon our faith in who you are, the creator, the invisible creator of the heavens and the earth. We honor you and we praise you for this time together. We ask you for a special word of wisdom. For you say, if you lack any wisdom, then just ask for it. And you'll not upbraid us because of our unbelief or hardness of heart. So we ask you for wisdom today, who already is Christ in us, but you said ask for it. So we ask you for wisdom, how to live this overcoming life of faith and in victory, causing us to triumph always in Christ Jesus. For this we thank you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and everybody said amen. amen. Say amen again. Amen. Say amen again. Amen. Good morning. All right. I gave you an outline this morning, and... Uh, just to, uh, if you will, uh, <laughs> give you an outline. If you, I want to talk this morning uh, about faith, finances, and family. But I want to talk to you really about. I mean, we've been dealing with faith ever since be, uh, one year before the pandemic. I did not know the pandemic was coming. I just felt in my heart and discerned that I, we need to talk about faith because you cannot have faith unless you really have start understand who God is. Because God is invisible, therefore, if you're going to come to somebody who is invisible, then you have to have faith because you cannot see them, taste, touch, smell, nor feel them. So, therefore, faith in God is really a, a, a metaphor as well as a, 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 it's, a, it's true, but it is, it, it's something you have to grasp with your mind that if something is invisible, you must believe that it exists. So faith in God is what that is. So faith in God in the invisible, who no one has ever seen or can see and live, is what we're dealing with. So faith in God. And from that, you have faith for everything else because that's where it is. If you don't have it, it's invisible. Therefore, you have to have faith for it. But you use faith in God because that's where it is. God has everything you need. And he's already given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. In other words, he has given you all that you need to uh, live victoriously in this life. He's given you the knowledge of who he is, the power of the Holy Spirit, his love, his mercy, which is un something you don't deserve. Mercy is giving, getting you out of something that you should have stayed in. That's what mercy is. Grace is helping you get something that you never had a, should have had a chance to get in the first place. And so that's grace and mercy. And then he's given us the measure of faith. And through this grace, we have this favor. Uh, grace is a favor that has been done for you without, have, without the expectation of you doing a reciprocal favor or doing a favor in return. One, you know, you do something for me, I'm going to do something for you. Some people cannot receive from other people because if you do something for them, they got to just turn around and do something back and give it back to you. That's not, that's not what it's about. People, some, many people have pride, and they cannot receive something to say thank you. They have to always find a way to give you something back because they don't really understand just grace, just a favor. Here, here's something I like to have. That's it. 
I don't want nothing. But you have to watch people who also want to manipulate people when they want to manipulate you because they want to do something for you and then throw it up in your face later. So you have to know the kind of people you're dealing with because that's something to be aware of. And so that's what fate grace is, a favor that is done without the expectation of a favor in return. So I was talking about faith that is in God. Faith is, uh, is the... Uh, is the belief and strong confidence. Faith is, uh, I had it, uh, it's, it's an assurance and to be firmly persuaded with the idea. Faith means to be firmly persuaded with an idea of a certain, of, of expect, certain, um, certain confidence. Faith is, means to be Firmly persuaded with the idea. It's because it's an idea. It's an idea of hope and certain expectation. That hope is a substance of things that you... Hope is, is something that you can't see. Romans chapter 8, verse 23 and 24. So you hope for it because you can't see it. So we all are saved in hope. It's something that we can't see. So faith is the... Uh, means to be firm persuaded with the idea about hope. And the hope has certain expectation. And so that's what faith is. So Hebrews says faith is the substance of things that you hope for. That you have, that you are firm persuaded with the idea of hope and certain expectation. How many of y'all expect certain things? You want some things out of life? You want some things from God? And he says, uh, hey, I tell you what. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. It's your mouth. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he'll meditate when? Day and night. He gonna be like a tree. Not God. He gonna be like a tree. So all the things that I've been talking to you about is planting seeds that will grow into trees, and then these things have grown up in you. That's why it takes time. And the Holy Spirit will water. One plants, one waters, but God gives the increase. So what I have been sharing with you is a seed. And I, some, I planted some, some little shrubs and, and hedges and bought some, went to the nursery, and the plant nursery, and, and brought some plants up here and planted some things in your hearts and in your lives. And they've been growing ever since. And you've been coming up here every week and I water them as much as I can and keep watering them. Then the Holy Spirit water them in the community and when you're wherever you are in your life. He waters the, waters the seed and it grows up in you and you eventually take it on and you say, oh, that's what it means. You grow into a tree. You shall be like a tree that's planted. And I have found that if you get up and run and rip and run and you aren't planted, you really don't get a chance to prosper and become strong like a tree. Because once a tree grows, you can run into it with a car. The tree is going nowhere. You tell your, People will tear themselves up trying to tear you up. But you got to become strong. Like a tree planted. We want to go to North Carolina and start a church. I said, it ain't, ain't nothing in Lakeland. We'll go to Lakeland to start a church and can't go back to Lakeland. Prophet is not without honor except in his own country and among his own relatives and all. Maybe go to Boston, stay in Boston and go to Charlotte. Uh, uh, may, you know, maybe I could, then I, one time, maybe I could be a school, uh, run for the school board. And I said, well, I could run for po po board of county commissioners, uh, run for city commission. I even got to, went down to the city hall and got the, the, the paper to apply for, for, uh, for the seat. And I fill out the paperwork and I say, how many of y'all have been tempted to do other things? It's not that you, it ain't good. It's question is, is this what is going to be in your best interest? It's going to help you with your forward progress. So there are a whole lot of things. So I call this message a three-way strategy to win in life. We're all familiar with four-way stop signs, but occasionally you have three, uh, three uh, inner streets coming together called a three-way stop. But a four-way stop sign, so I have this message called three-way strategy to win in life. In other words, faith is not for lazy people. If you're lazy, you don't like me, you don't like the message, you can't stand what I'm preaching because you're lazy. 
And so you're just lazy. And lazy people don't like to talk about faith because faith, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 5 or 6, faith works. And then James says faith without works is what? Dead on arrival. So faith is dead if it ain't doing nothing. And because faith, I used to say it so fast, so I say faith works by love. Faith works by love. I was speaking it so fast that I, I skipped all over the word. We just skipped all over the word. But faith works. And while it's working, you know why it works so much? Because it loves what it's working for. But it's going to work. And whatever you really love, that's what you're going to work for. And that's why when your faith is in God, and wherever you don't care where your work in what your occupation or your career is, it doesn't matter. You got to understand that the earth is the Lord's, and you may your needs may be getting met through your employer, but God is your source. And so, what who you when, whenever you work, you do all you do as unto the Lord. So, in other words, you're always working for God. So you on your job, and you got a supervisor, and you got a, a, a administrator, and you got an executive director, and a president, all that stuff. But you're there working for them, but you're really in your heart and in your mind as a believer, you're working for the Lord. And nobody has to come and tell you to get up and move. I used to, years ago, I used to be kind of like sitting, I would, be, I would work so hard that I would sit down, and then the boss would walk up. Well, then, when you're sitting down and the boss walk up, what you going to do? Oh, y'all know about that, don't you? And so you jump up. Well, I, 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 I grew in my faith. I feel that, uh, I grew in my faith, and what I started doing was, I would just I'd keep on sitting down. When the boss walk up, I'd sit on down. I said, I, you know, and I wouldn't even say anything. Why? Because my work spoke for me. You want to live in such a way that your work will speak for you. Yes. Amen? So then, faith is not for lazy folks. But that's the title. And I want to look at first, the first thing I want you to look at is Matthew chapter 12 and verse 29. Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments, this is on the outline. Who does not have an outline? All right. Please raise your hand, ushers. Please get them one. I, all right. The first of all the commandments is, here, let's read together, hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Number one, here is the first win. The win is what? You shall what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Anybody else needs one? All right. Down here to the other side. All right. The second win is what I call a win-win. Win is the second one is like this. That is what? You shall love Y'all got it? Read with me. You shall love your neighbor. Okay? Ushers, please come down here. Just, you got, you got three or four? All right. Y'all, please ushers, do that while I'm doing this. Let's continue. Well, the second one is you shall love your what? Neighbor. The third one is what just, now, God wants you to love your neighbor just as much as you love yourself. You got three there. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Come on, and, and you love your neighbor as much as you love what? Yourself. That's three. Remember that let every, at the mouth of two or three, look up here, look up here. At the mouth of what? Two or three witnesses let what? Come on, you're not strong enough. What is it? Every matter. Let what? Every matter be established. So if every matter is included in this whole thing, you need, I'm going to just say it like this. Some of y'all didn't find your, find your right spouse until you was on your third marriage. That'll get your attention. Well, I thought the first one was it, and we didn't get along. The second one was it. That didn't get along. Now you're on your third one. You're trying to, at the mouth of what? Two or three what? Now, now I think we're on the same page. 
So I call that a win, win, win. You're going to love the Lord your God and your what? And your neighbor just as much as you love what? Yourself. Look at number two. The next thing I want to point, look, point, to point out to you is this. Number B is to, we all know that how houses are built. Houses are built first. You dig the footer and you pour what? A foundation. You have to have a foundation. But nobody told me this. You have to do the same thing for your life. You need a foundation for your life. You say, well, I'm 60 years old. I'm close to retiring. You got children who are now adults. You got grandchildren. You got neighbors and friends. If, if it's past the, your year to be doing what I'm sharing with you, tell somebody else. Share it with somebody else. Don't just say, well, I don't need it, and therefore you don't get it. You need to be a... He who waters will himself be watered. Give. And it will be given to you. Don't just say, well, no, nah, I ain't. Speak to the hand, all that kind of stuff. You need to pass this along to somebody else so they won't have to catch as much hell as you caught. As long as you caught it. And sweat with it and don't and thinking God gonna do it for him. He gonna put me out of this. Yeah. Yeah, right. So you have to pull a financial foundation for your life and for your family. Now we we talked about Rich Dad here, and I as a matter of fact, in nineteen ninety nine we bought a duplex and uh bought another duplex and then Cindy were asked me, Well, what took you so long, Pastor? Because it was we built the first one on twelfth street in 1975 and in 1999 when we bought another one she said well what took you so long I didn't even know didn't even dawn on me that when you pay for a house long enough you pay down your what your mortgage and the house if, if the economy is okay the house goes up in oh now everybody, everybody got it now I got it yeah it goes up in what value and the difference between the value of your house and the balance that you owe on it is called what? Equity. Equity. That's your savings account. This is what the American government did when they redlined black communities in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s and told us we could not live where they lived and they would not give us loans for our neighborhoods. And then we had to, our houses were less, we made less money, the houses were smaller, and because they knew that the value, this was the government y'all trust. Jesus said, no, you rent under Caesar, the things that are Caesar, but you better make sure you rent under God, the things that are God. I like Caesar, I respect Caesar, but, my, and you know, Jesus, he, Isaiah 33, 22, 33, 22, Isaiah 33, 22, says, the Lord is my king, the Lord is my judge, the Lord is my lawgiver. He will save us. <laughs> he will save us. Now, how many of y'all have been saved by God or by the government? Yeah, thank you. Dr. How, name the number, count the number of times the government saved you. There are people, the government consists of people who run for office that we vote for and they do the best they can. The average people like us, we put in, vote for them in the office and they then run, keep order and safety. That's all they do. That's, they, they keep the streets and the pavement and the defense and the public safety and police and all the, everything else, everything you could lights and utilities. They make our lives orderly. But the money is over in the private sector. The government ain't got no money. The government has to go and tax everybody else who's working to get some money, these are representatives, to get money to provide the services. That's why ain't nothing free that the government gives you. The money is coming from the people who got the jobs. I'm going somewhere this morning. Do you want to go with me? All right. So then I understand that. And so I appreciate the government. We got the best one in the world. Say what you want about everything that's going on, but you're still in the best place in the world. You got to make yourself content if you're going to be creative. If you're always on the go and you're itching to get out, you'll, your creative uh, 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 abilities will not blossom and flourish where you are. You got to brighten up the corner. Right where you're at. I found out, well, well, I need to go, I need to go, to, some people say, well, I need to go to New York. 
so I can make it. I need to go to uh, California so I can get discovered. I need to go, you need to go somewhere else. No, 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 no. There's money everywhere. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, there's money everywhere. I used to think the more raggedy houses down there in the Black Bottom and on Fifth Street where there was drugs and people hanging all out in the street. Ain't nothing down there but drug dealers. Why you think the dealings, what you, why you think they dealing, what you think they dealing in? There is an exchange of money for drugs. Money is everywhere. But well, I need to go make some money. Now, you can make money right where you are. Let me continue. So, we read Rich Dad's book in, in 2000. Now, uh, get rid of shade. Now, look at this. Why am I doing this? 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Let's read. It says what? Take heed. Now, take heed means to, you all know about marriage, where in the ceremony the, pastor, the minister says, where well, you take have to have and to what? Hold. So the word take heed means to have something and hold on to it. That's what it literally means. It means to have and to hold. But you need to take care to yourself. You need to hold yourself. Take yourself and hold yourself. Listen to yourself. Take heed to yourself. Auto is autograph. And what? And to the doctrine. The doctor, the word doctor means to know and to teach by word of mouth. To know and teach by word of mouth. And when people are learning Easter speeches, Christmas speeches, and learning for plays and things, and they don't read, you, you have to read it to them, and they say it over and over. Say it after me. Say it over. When you're a little, little, little child who can't read, you, they learn little parts, little short phrases, and they learn it. But you have to say it over, over and over. And how do you remember stuff? Memorization is about what? Repeating it. Over and over. Once you say it enough, you don't sometimes it takes a hundred times, two hundred, you don't know what it is. It takes a long time. And some of y'all don't know John 3.16 yet. And so it's doctrine. So doctrine means to know it, and then it's one thing to know something. But do you know? I heard a pastor say this. You, when you're going to have your private meditation times in the morning times, whenever you do your meditations, you study and you read your Bible. That's good. Thank God for that. But you know, if you had to stand up before a group of three or four or five people, or maybe 10 or 12 people, or a, a church, or in the front of somebody, and you had to, your study will be different. You're not going to, you're going to study totally different when you got to get up here and say something to greet somebody, or you got to say something to, 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 to you can prepare yourself differently. I recommend all of you, in your study, study like you're going to teach somebody else. Because if you study like you're going to teach somebody else, you will get more out of it, even though you're not going to teach somebody else. But it's as if you're going to teach somebody else. Because you've got to be prepared and, 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 and really be prepared to do so. And you'll study differently. It's not just meditating. Meditating is good and, and doing your quiet time and your Bible study, but study like you're going, somebody going to call on you to, to teach what you, you're reading. Uh, you'll, change, you'll change your way of your study. So that's what a doctrine means. It is to know and to teach by word of mouth. Matthew 20, the same word uh, uh, doctrine is found in Matthew 28, 20, where it says, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. So Jesus was teaching them to observe all things. Pay attention to what I have told you. And many people who don't, who don't, are not disciplined when they're young to pay attention. They don't grow out of that thing and they become grown folks with a short attention span. Attention span. They gotta, they, they can't, they just, they always gotta be fidgeting with something. They always gotta, you, you, they, 10 minutes, you, you can't get nothing out of them. They never develop their minds. They can't sit still. They got to shake their foot. They got to get a pencil. Be still. You know, in other words, tell your flesh, sit down and be quiet. Luke chapter 11 and verse 1, the, the disciples said to Jesus, teach us to pray. Didaskelos, didactic reasoning, didicate. Teach us to pray. In other words, you have to be taught to pray, and then you have to pray for others. Because when you're going to pray, you, you can, somebody can teach you about prayer, but the way you're going to really learn to pray, you start praying for somebody else. 
And the best way to practice is to start praying for yourself. When you start praying for yourself, the first thing come up, I'm always cussing. I'm always cussing. Someone said, I curse this in the name of Jesus. <laughs> I thought that Jesus, Peter said he cussed, but he, Jesus didn't say he cursed. But Peter said, you cursed that tree. That's what Peter said. But you, in the name of Jesus, I, I just curse it right there on the spot. You ain't going to, whatever it is, it ain't going nowhere here. I just stop it right there. You say, well, that, that's kind of fanatic, don't you? Well, y'all fans with certain football teams and basketball teams, don't tell me I can't be a fanatic uh, when it comes to applying the principles of God to something that's going to affect my life. Why are you jumping on my case? Just stay in your place. So I just care. Hey, hey, hey. I don't care what it is. Come mm -mm. now, and then I get prayer later for somebody to agree with me. You know, but you, you can. You, Jesus said in Luke chapter uh, four, verse eighteen, where he says, "The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me." He said, "Surely, surely, you all will say this proverb. If y'all so good at what y'all doing, see, it's one thing to know it, but it's another thing to be able to teach somebody else. If you're gonna, prepare, if you're gonna teach somebody that you're gonna be really be prepared, He said, "If you're so good at it." And you know so much. Heal your physician. Heal yourself. Don't tell me about how smart you are. If you can't heal your own self, how in the world are you going to help me get myself healed? That's what Jesus said. So then I said, well, I need, we need to work on ourselves. I don't need to be working on making you my object lesson. I need to work on me. So I, and I think Shakespeare said, Who to thine own self, be true. In other words, start working on you. Be honest with yourself. Can you be honest with your own self? And so, number four. He says, now, take heed to yourself. Continue where? That means to mino, imp, imp uh, epi, mino, which means upon, is stay, stay or remain. It means to hold in there. Hold these doctrines. Continue in these doctrines. And why you need to continue in these doctrines? For what? In doing this. Now, and then the phrase came to me. We just said, uh, when we commune, do this. And as often as you do this, you show forth my death until I come again. And just like we do communion, so in doing this. Now, I want to mention one thing about communion in Luke chapter 22 and verse 17. Jesus says, take, you have to be willing to take it for yourself. You got to take this, have this break. I want this for me. The question is, will you answer that question? Take this for me, this, and the, he's, notice what he said, and divide it among yourselves. Why didn't he say just, just take it? He said, and divide it among yourselves because some people are going to get a smaller piece. Some will have a bigger piece. It's like dividing up the land. When Joshua divided up the land after Moses died, he went and divided up the land among the 12 tribes of Israel. And everybody's territory was a different size. So Jesus said, take this and divide it up among yourselves. So some of y'all are going to get small pieces because you don't want to do but certain things. Some of y'all are going to grab the whole as much as you can get. And some are going to grab a little bit. Some ain't going to grab none. Because there are four kinds of grounds. The seed, some fell along the wayside, some fell among thorns, some fell among rocks, and some fell on good ground. There are four kinds of people. And so I decided, if I'm good ground, if I hear something good, I'm going to work that thing. I, you know, I ain't no dummy. I flunked the fifth grade, but I ain't no fool. One thing my grandmama drilled in me when I was growing up. Mickey, look up here, look up here. She said, Mickey. I said, ma'am. I ain't raising you to be no fool. Now y'all look up here. Look up here. Look up here. Look up here. Everybody look up here. I'm going to tell y'all. I ain't raising y'all to be nobody's fool and let folk use you and abuse you and mislead you. You understand? No, no, no. I feel like an old man now. I feel like a father. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, don't with them. Um, because the tree has to grow up yes. and you want to be if somebody is running to you you ain't gonna you ain't gonna fall over somebody die in your family you ain't gonna forget to try to crawl up in the casket 
they went to be with the Lord. We are on our way. We are going. We ain't no hurry to get there. To prove you're lying to yourself, you ain't trying to kill yourself. You don't want to really go. But we're so used to deceiving others and putting on fronts. Until Sure, you're going to miss the person. You say, well, that's not genuine. That's not genuine. Yes, it's genuine. But you've got to just be real. Moderate yourself. You know, there used to be a whole lot of that carrying on until faith starts growing in your heart. You will feel like, you know, it's, it's not worth, life is not worth living. But once you really come to understand faith in God, your life will be really worth living. Amen? And he says, take this, divide this among yourselves, that those who hear you taking heed, they'll do it. And he says, this is my body, which is what? I, I want you to take this because I, it's what? It's given for you. It's given for you all to do this with. And the translators overlook this because over in Psalm 34, verse 19 and 20, you know where we always quote the scripture? Many of the afflictions of the righteous. Y'all know what that is? Come on. That's where it is. Many of the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivers us out of them all. Y'all know what that is, right? Read the next verse. Where is it? You got it? The next verse says, He guards his life, I believe it says, and not a bone will be broken. If you got it there, all right, now, many of the afflictions, of, and not a bone will be broken. Right there in the next verse, for many of the afflictions of the righteous, and he guards them. Why? But the Lord delivers us out of them all. Why? He guards him, and not a bone will be broken. You know that's a promise? You, don't, you can just start saying, I ain't falling. You know, when people get older, they say they start falling. You don't need to be falling when you're 80 and 90 years old. You don't need nothing broken. You don't need to be breaking nothing. Because sometimes a cough will kill you. <laughs> You catch the flu when you're 100, you, anything can take you out of him. So you want to make sure you stay healthy. You got it? I mean, stay healthy and, and, and fight for your life. You know, some people like to have houses, but I ask you, do you want to have a life to live in the house, or do you want a house to live, uh, how can I say it, I wrote it down. Do you want a, a house for your life, or a life for your house? The Lord spoke to me when I was coming out. Some people, want, some people want a house for their life. But you need to have a life for your house. He who builds the house is greater than the house. Amen? Amen. So then, he says this. Look at this. Um, first so then he says, not a bone will be broken. But, of course, 1 Corinthians, I mean, 2 Corinthians chapter, I mean, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 24 says, uh, if you look at it, he says, uh, broken for you. This is my body. And the translators overlook, overlook uh, Psalm 34, 19 and says, this is my body broken for you. No, his body was not broken. But because tradition, we just, we just, we just say it anyway. Well, fine. It's not, it's not going to be, it's not here nor there, but just need to know it. Number six, he says, and if you will do this and take heed this, you'll be able to save yourself. See, we say God going to save me. And we just said it in Isaiah 33, 22. The, the Lord is my king. The Lord is my judge. The Lord is my lawgiver. He's going to save us. Yeah, he's going to save you. But you know how he's going to do it. He's going to give you all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's going to give you the knowledge of God. He's going to give you the power of the Holy Spirit. He's going to build you up. He says he gives you the power to, to pray in the Spirit, to build your own self up, in, up on your most holy faith as you pray in the Holy Spirit. He gives you the power to get wealth. Are you listening? Amen. Oh, but God going to do it for me. He's going to do it for you by giving you what you need to do it. Yes. Yes. That's why you're asking for wisdom. Lord, I need some understanding. What does Solomon pray? Wisdom. Get what? Wisdom. Knowledge. You got to get it. And in all your what? Get what? Who get, who go, so who needs it? Thank you. So God has given you, he has given us all things. Now, the reason you need to believe that, because if you say, well, Lord, I asked you to give me some understanding, that means you don't have it. The only thing the scripture says in the New Testament, asking for it. James says, if you lack wisdom. Not everybody is dumb. If you lack wisdom, and you don't know what to do in a situation, you ask the Lord for wisdom, he'll lead you to somebody. He'll, he'll direct you to somebody. You got to find somebody who, to give you some advice, 
basically, uh, watch this now. Who has advice to give you that comes out of their ability to make a life at, in the advice that they're going to give you. In other words, if they're going to give you some advice, make sure it's working for them. You got it? If you need an accountant, you don't need somebody who just said, well, you know, I, I, I do taxes every year. Every, every year. I just, I just, you got a license, you got a certification, you're taking the last class. I just do I've been doing taxes for 45 years, honey. You're missing out on some breaks. Some tax breaks, shelter. You, you're missing out on a whole lot. You go to somebody who made their living at, hey, make their living at finding loopholes. And then you'll save yourself. Uh, well, uh, would, would you go to a doctor and who, uh, who wasn't licensed and say, well, you know, I, I'm going to just go to, you know, some doctors can only give you. When, we had, when I grew up, certain doctors, people said, you only go to him uh, if you got a cold. Because some of them doctors, that's all they good. They don't know nothing else. They gonna, you got a cold. You all know what I'm talking about. You <laughs> Them doctors, some of them doctors, they ain't good for nothing but a cold. But when you got a real serious situation, you're going to find you a, 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 what you call a, what, a real doctor. The same thing with pastors and preachers. You find pastors and preachers, on, they're, they're a dime a dozen. They ain't all of them want to be apostles now. All of them want to be, uh, I say, ain't but a few preachers left. A few pastors left. Uh, ain't but a handful of pastors left. And then they want to, and they all want to give you, tell you what to do with your life. Look at theirs. Don't, don't you tell me what to do with mine. I, my, I, got, I, did, I, I got more confidence and assurance than you got, preacher. Now, I couldn't have preached this 35, 45 years ago. See, I wouldn't have been this bold with it. But you, you have to grow in grace. The tree has to grow, my friend. If you don't grow the tree, if the tree is planted beside the rivers of water, it's going to grow because it naturally puts its roots down at the right place. And you don't let people always dig you up and transplant you and put you over here today. Next year, two years, you're somewhere else. Five years now, you're somewhere else. You ain't going nowhere in your life. You got to go through tough times because the tree, in order for the tree to grow, it got to stay in that soil, get the DNA of the soil, and get rained on and peed on and hit by cars and not the bark knocked off of and pruned and pruned. The tree going to be pruned. The leaves going to go through. You got to go through cold weather and summertime and hot weather and rain. You got to go through it. You can't run. Calm down. You can't run, my friend. You, can think. you gotta just stay put. If you can just, you have to come to this. I, I, you gotta just learn to just tough it out. See, it'll happen that way in your marriage. I ain't get on that. It'll happen that way. It'll happen in your relationship. I need to find me another one. Where they all, all of them got their feet stained. I need to get me another one. Well, there ain't no Cadillac in a Volkswagen, you know. He said, if you, if you, if you'll do this, my friends, he said, you will save, you will, you will save, not only, not the Lord, you will save what? Both what? You're going to save both yourself and you'll be able to save those. Now, why did he say these who hear you? He said those, because these people who are close to you ain't studying you hardly. The ones you're trying to reach ain't listening to you. They grew up with you. You heard this phrase? Familiarity breeds contempt. And sometimes the ones you really want to help, they ain't thinking about you. They'd rather get the help from somebody but listen to somebody else. They, you can help them, you can help them, and you won't help them because they're your flesh and blood. But they ain't thinking about you, and all you do is think about them. He said, but you'll save yourself and those. Who at a distance, not these who are close to you, but those who will hear you. Because there's some people you can, who will listen to you and take your advice. And they ain't no kin to you. They are not a relative. They ain't your family. But they are the ones who will hear you. They will let you help them. Sometimes your own folks won't even take your word for nothing. And they'll tell you, I don't want to hear you. 
Stop trying to run in my life. Another thing is number two there, he says, and most people are hung up over borrowing, uh, borrowing, and most people are not hung up over borrowing and lending. See, none of y- all y'all know, I bet y'all you borrowed some money in the last 25 years, right? Come on. At least, I don't going to ask you to raise your hand, but in 25 or 35 years, you're going to borrow some money. Okay. Now, we're not deceived when it comes to borrowing money. We're just mixed up on what kind of money to borrow? Uh, you know, deceive into mixing. You you got it mixed up. Second Kings. See, God is not against you borrowing stuff. That's the way you're gonna get ahead. Second Kings chapter six and verse five. Uh, you can read the whole in time. You can read the whole the first seven verses. Elijah's. Let's read. Elijah's servant needs space to build a larger house. Verse five says what? But as one was cutting down a tree. The iron axe head fell into the water, and he cried out and said, Alas, my master, for it was borrowed. Elisha, the prophet, helps ministry workers and his staff and his servants, had borrowed an axe to build their house. And so then as the, in chopping the tree down and near the stream, a it, 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 uh, river, whatever, the axe head flew off and, and went in order. And, of course, it's a miracle. And the law wants you to get your axe back. And there's another verse. That's why you need to sharpen your mind. Because the Bible says, if when the axe is dull, the labor is hard. The sharper you are at everything you need to do. The easier it is. Have you ever tried to use a dull knife in your kitchen? You can't even cut a piece of bologna with a dull knife. It can't get no traction. So you need a sharp, you need something to sharpen you. And you know what sharpens each other? The frank, unvarnished truth from a close friend. Somebody's going to say that you're close enough to. And they'll tell you. Your breast stink. And you'll take it. You say, you think so? <laughs> ah, you know, you need to clean that dirt out of your fingernails. I, you know, if I, you, I, you, you know. You, you know, you, you, you're a friend. You, that'll help you out. You get sharper that way. You know, say, you know what? Uh, I've been watching you a long time. I think you're lazy. You know, and they'll take it. They'll tell you. Then uh, my grandma, yeah, here's another thing. Yeah, my grandma said this to me. No, said it to Carrie. Carrie, Mickey don't want nobody to tell him nothing. Well, what was she trying to tell me? Hear where I'm coming from? If you submit to somebody who's trying to tell you something, you better make sure they've either been there and done that or have some experience with it or have some, something more about it than you do. But it's unwise to go get your advice off the street, off the sidewalk, in the parking lot, and on your telephone when you get home. From people who haven't even done what you're thinking of wanting, desiring, to aspiring to do. All they're going to do is, a, is the mutual admiration society. We're going to tell each other how fine we are, as messy as we are. Two, two, two babies with dirty diapers. Now, why did you put that? <laughs> look at this. Look at, look, at, look at Proverbs 22 and verse 6. Read. Now, here's, here's, this is important. That's why I said, listen, tell. If your children don't hear you, tell some other children. They'll hear you. Tell them. I had this pastor. My pastor. Let me tell you what this pastor told me. 
See, you don't have to say who the pastor is. They might not like that pastor. Now, a pastor told me something, and let me tell you about it. See, you can just tell him like that. And, and you, he says what? Train up a child in the way that he what? Not that he would go, but he, he, he ought to go in that direction. So you need to point him in the right direction. And when he is old, he will what? Not depart from it. Now, here's what you need to train them, them about. The what? Because what? The rich people rule over the poor. And the borrower is subject to the lender. And neither one is wrong. It's the question is, what do you want for yourself? Do you want to be ruled over? Or you want to rule? Or do you want to be a borrower? Or do you want to be a lender? It's neither either one. You can just take a choice. Then Luke chapter 16 and verse 9, Jesus said what? And I say unto you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. Why? Let's listen to this. Make friends for yourself with your money. Notice what he says. With your, and he calls it unrighteous what? Mammon. Why would the Bible, why would Jesus say money? You know, I, I, I'm impressed with what I be saying sometimes. I'll be trying to figure out, where did, how do I get this here? It's a, why would the Bible say, uh, 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 make friends with your unrighteous mammon? No, remember now, no word is in the Bible by accident. So it's in there for a purpose. So you've got to find out, well, what's that word? Why would he just say, why would he say, uh, make friends? Why didn't, wouldn't he say, uh, make friends with your mammon? He said, because this is what? He's trying to make another point. Because the Bible uses illustrations and analogies, allegories, and and parables to make another point about something else is never talking about all the time what you think it's talking about. That's why you have to have ears to hear, a heart to believe, okay, and eyes that see. Because many have eyes that see, Isaiah said, and ears to hear, but you don't hear nothing. You have eyes that don't see and ears that don't hear and mouths that don't talk. And so are those who worship them. Them, those items like that. And so he says now, he says, because money makes us righteous with your friends. When you got money and your friend needs some money and you can help your friend, that friend sees you as what? A friend. Because you were willing to help them, what? With the money you had. I didn't say give it to them. Don't, get, don't, go, don't draw up your toes now. I didn't say give it to them. Get your promissory note. If it's over over, over, based on what level it is and the, the, the nature of your relationship, you get your promissory note right on a piece of paper. So you're going to owe me this much money, you're going to pay me by a certain day, and the, the interest rate is going to be. So you've got, you got to make money on your money. Interest rate is the money you're going to make on your money. If I'm going to lend you $100 back and you bring me $100 back, that's just a friend. That's right. But if you want to make some money, you know, you're going to turn yourself into a little banker. That means then you put a little interest. Now, how much interest are you going to give me on this? Because I, I, I got to go get it. They're going to charge me $5 on my account to draw it out early. Then how much are you going to give me? I need you to pay me at least 5 plus some more. You know, you can, you can calculate how much. It'll be just a flat $25. Or you can, I know a man, he was a loan shark, 100%. Whatever I loan you, you're going to double it pay me back. You give me, if in six months, you're going to double it. And some people have borrowed $2,500. They still owe you $2,500, but the deal is you're going to pay them $100 a month until, the until you pay the $2,500. So you're going to pay $100 a month, and then you can pay it 12 months or 15 months, and at the end of the 15 months, you still got to cough up the what? The $2,500. That's a fool with some money. My uncle would do that. He loans some money. And they, the, the people just, the, you, you, you got to look at the deals. But when you're going to loan people money, you need some kind of promissory note, something in writing. Don't trust people, just trust. Let them know. He says, now, so then as money makes you righteous with your friend, faith makes you right with God. Because that's what he's really saying. That's what he's really saying. Well, you know how you feel when somebody loans you money and don't pay you back. And they ain't right with you. But they pay you back like they said and pay you back early. I'll pay you back a little more and just say, I want to thank you in here. I want to give you this just for helping me out. Then they fright with you. And the same way you use your money, that's the way faith works with God. That's what he's talking about. That when you fail, that your money, your friends will receive you into the everlasting home. What is the, el what is the everlasting home of your friends? You know what the everlasting home of your friends is? 
is the memories about how you used your unrighteous mammon which helped them achieve their dreams, desires, and aspirations. And that's just like faith is, an everlasting memory. When your friends help you, they're going to talk about how you helped them for years to come. I talk about my teacher who taught me music. I talk about my teacher who taught me typing. I talk about my grandma who helped me, my grandma helped me in some other areas, but then she tried to hold me back in some other areas. And friends who've done things for me and helped me out. You got a, 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 a it's called a wealth of friends. Somebody who's helped you. The everlasting, see, because what it says, that they will receive you into that everlasting home. Where is the everlasting home of somebody with some mammon in their thoughts and in their memories? They're going to always talk about you. I remember this minister needed some money. And this man was going to try to, we, we, we're trying to work out, help the ministry here. And so, but he didn't have the money. He, he knew somebody who had the money. That's another thing. Sometimes you can ask a person, well, how would you solve the problem? They say, I'll call you. I had a situation happen lately. I said, if you couldn't reach me, what would you do? Well, I'll call back. I said, that's okay. I said, now, or if you couldn't reach me again, what would you do? I, 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 would, just leave, I would text you. I said, okay. If you couldn't reach me by text, what would you do? Well, I would just keep call. I just call. And I had to ask five or six times. Because when your mind is blocked and your eyes are dark and your ax is dull, I said, when you're calling somebody and you can't reach them, you know somebody that they know. So who do, you, who do I know that you think would be able to get in touch with me? You know Ms. Layla, you know the secretary, you know Sister Mary, you know some folks, so you know somebody who can get in touch with who you need to know. Do you all understand that? You need somebody who can get a prayer through. And the mem and just like your, so it's, that's what faith does for you. And so that's what you have to do. Don't ever accept no. When you have asked for something, you know what your answer, you want your answer to be. Am I right? If you know what your answer is to be, then, and you hear no, no, if the phone rang and I didn't, and I didn't answer it, the answer is what? No. Don't take no. You find a way to get a yes. You find a way to get a yes. Rich Dad says like this. If uh, you, uh, if you, uh, trying to get, get something done, just work around it. Just always work around whatever it is until you get it. Just work around it. Just like I said in this conversation, the, the, the line is busy. People are not answering. Well, I'm going to reach the person. And just because you tell me no, don't mean I can't have it. I hope you're listening. In your life, when you hear no, you heard no from that person. But that's not your answer. I'm going to say that again. I hope you heard that. The no is not your answer. If it's your health and the doctor says he can't help you, that ain't your answer. That might not be your doctor. Don't you accept no for an answer. Let the, for the promises of God in Christ Jesus always in him, yea. And Amen. Don't accept no. Well, I can't. I just call back. I leave a text. We'll come. We'll call overcomers. I gotta come over this no, cause this this no is in my way. I gotta go until I get to me a yes, and I will work until I come up on yes. You run until you come up on yes. Then public charitable giving violates Matthew chapter six verse thirty three and four. Read, but when you do your what? Charitable deeds. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deeds may be what? In secret, and your father who is in sees in secret will himself reward you how? Openly. So now, so I, I, I gave you an outline. Somebody said, oh, you know, when you're going to help somebody who is in a need 
a poor, the homeless, the poor, the whoever you're helping, you don't tell them about what you're doing. Just do it. And when you're gonna when you're gonna give them something, you know, I'm gonna help you out now. Uh, you know, you shouldn't be no. If you gotta say all that, keep it. Don't don't help me like that. You're gonna wash my face with it, and you're gonna judge me and condemn me, and you're gonna give it, take it and shove it, cause I don't want it. When you're going to help somebody, help them. And don't, tell, don't, don't let nobody, they, that's it. That's what he's talking about. Now, I'll cover this Wednesday and I'll share as we continue. But a man plant, I mean, let's, go, let's go. I'm going to run over a few minutes. Here we go. Let's go. All right, now, one of seven ways to prosper financially is in the scripture. Matthew 21, 33 says what? Hear another parable. There was, number one, what? A certain land. We bought the church land. There's nothing on the land, but there is. there are some houses next to it, and it produces rent. All right? Vacant land does not produce money. One day it might sell, and you might make some money, but having land, people say, oh, I want some land. You ain't going to do them to pay taxes because it doesn't generate anything. Okay? That's what he said. It was a landowner. But look at what this landowner did with the land. But number two, he what? Planted a vineyard. Because when you plant a vineyard on it, it does what? Y'all with me now? Y'all, yeah, you with me, got it? And the third thing he says, and he said what? He said a hedge around it. In other words, the hedge around it was an insurance policy for its security. Do you know if you have insurance on your car and somebody hit it, I ain't worried, I got insurance. I told Carol and, and, and uh, Mary, and I said, if I'm on vacation and the church burned down, don't call me. Call the fire department. We got insurance. I don't care. You got to insurance will buy you peace of mind. I told my son when he bought that motorcycle. I told you that story. He bought that motorcycle. I went to the insurance man, put a hundred thousand dollars on him. He signed. You know, he put on. Now I got peace of mind. I got some leverage. Now listen, you go out there and drive one hundred ten miles an hour on a motorcycle, and you kill yourself. It's gonna be worth a hundred thousand dollars to me and your mama. What am I telling him? I love you, and I want you to be careful. That's all it says. That's all it says. You say, that ain't the way to do it. Peace, be still. <laughs> Number four, he then what? Dug a wine press. That is, that's a security system, a moat all the way around it so nobody could get to it. Sometimes you might need a fence. You might a, a, a rock wall, a Doberman, a gun, or something. You ain't make sure ain't nobody gonna get. To, be careful and wise. You know, security system on your pass, passwords on your security system on your passwords on your internet stuff. Number five, and he built what a tower to control the access to see who's going and coming. Number six, and he what then he leased it to the vine dresser. You know what a lease is? A lease is a contract by which one party conveys land or property or services. To another, and get this, it's for a specific time, a year maybe, or six months, or two years, usually in return for a periodic payment. You're going to pay like a mortgage payment. You're going to borrow $100,000 to, to build, buy a house. You're going to pay installments every month. That's a lease, or it could be a contract of purchase. Number seven, and guess what? Because once he had this contract, it freed him up to do what? And he went into a far country. So when you all see us going around somewhere, I'm just obeying the scriptures. All I'm doing is obeying the script. I found the answer. I got the answer, y'all. And then and now, but now there's a problem. Now I'm going to explain this in a minute. I'm going to continue. But run, listen, so I'm going to run away. I'm going to tell you now. Romans chapter seven and verse twenty-one says what? But I find a law. Here's the problem. The law read. That evil is present. Notice, where is it? With me. So the problem is not with God. The problem is with you. Evil is with, present with me. John Maxwell calls it the law of the lead. In his book, 21 Irrefutable Laws, he calls the first law in the book. 
is the law of the lid. And we call it the subconscious mind. The way you were raised controls you today. And the only way you can change the way you were raised or change where you're going to be able to go in spite of how you were raised is going to use, you're going to, you, you must use what we call the confession of your faith. Now I'll show you, I'm going to prove it to you. Watch this. So he says, uh, it, it determines your effectiveness as a leader. And the one who wills to what? To do good. In other words, the law of the lid wages war against the confession of your faith. Well, what do you mean? Why is it so important for you to tell me what you plan to do with your life? The universe is listening. The world is listening. People are listening. Faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by the word of John Smith, Willie, Charlie, Mary, Sue, whoever. You got it? And for hearing by whosoever word it is. You need to hear your own what? Words. Other folk need to hear your own words. They need to hear you say, this is what I'm going to do. And eventually they'll start saying, yo, he, he getting ready to do this. You know what? She's going to do this. She done told me she's going to do this. And they'll start agreeing with you and confess. And the power of your confession adds up, multiplies, and becomes more and more preponderance of the evidence and it builds up so much power until now everybody else's confession and it's easier for you. That's how the confession works. You need to open your mouth. I shall live. That, that's the man say he gonna live and not die right there. And it, the more you say it, the more people say he said he gonna live and not die. Then that man say he, he, he'll never be sick a day in his life. And everybody here, they start saying he you see him, he the one said it. Remember in the Bible, it says there was a man who set out to, no one plans to go out to war unless you first sit down and do what? Count the cost. But there was a man, you don't set out to build a house unless you sit down first and do that. Unless you start to build a house and you can't finish the house and then somebody come along and say, look, that's the man right there. He started to build a house and he couldn't finish it. That's why you need to not, not only count the cost, but you need to make your confession. Because you want to finish the house that you're trying to build. And unless the Lord builds the house, how are you going to build this house? You're going to build it using what he gave you to use. What's the materials that he's gave you, given you to use? It's the, the word of your mouth, the confession of your faith, your prayers. He has given you all things that you need, your, his love. He's given you love. He's given you patience and understanding and wisdom and knowledge and long-suffering, gentleness and goodness, faith, meekness and temper. He's given you all this stuff. You need to use it and build your house. That's how the Lord builds the house. We talked about how churches have been, I, I, be, think, I think it's unbiblical to, I looked at the Carpenter's Home Church, Crenshaw Center, Robert Shuler's Crystal Cathedral, Jim Baker PTL, all these other, just putting all this money in all these buildings for, to meet two hours. And then it's like, I don't think God, please look at the situation, look at the results. Even throughout Europe with the Catholic churches, many of them are museums. In Russia, they're all museums. And so we put all this money in the building so we can feel good and, and have the people to say, oh, that pastor built a big church. The church is not a building, my friend. The church is where? Well, in you. The church, that's where the church is. I hope you don't think it's up in here. So he says this. He says, uh, it can, it, so now, so pay off. So then Karen and I had a decision to make. Uh, so looking at what we did was we, in pull up, Lachela, pull up number one, please. I did not know this. John was here, and all, many of you were here. Uh, and and uh, number one, if you have it, in 1997, we paid our taxes. And we paid our taxes. Look up here. You, you ain't going to find it on there. It's up here. In 1997, I decided to write a check. I sat out. You ask me where this come from. I just decided, I don't know where you, I can't tell you. All I know is I, I, I get these ideas. And I wrote a check. I wrote a check in 1997 for $1,000,000. And I put my date of birth on there. And I put Walter Lee on I did it. And I, and I forgot all about it. 
I owe everyone, I wrote my four children, they were children, they didn't know what this meant. I wrote each one of them a million dollar check, I wrote one for my wife, and I wrote one for myself. And I put it in my wallet and wore it out. All right, you can take that one down. And I wore the check out because I carried it everywhere I went. And I said, I'm going to cash this check one day. I'm going to cash this check one day. And I kept saying it until I forgot all about it. I forgot I even was saying it. Until I, uh, somebody came to my house. He said, Pastor, I was there that Sunday you told me, a Sunday, when you mentioned this. And I was doing it at that time. And I was telling you all what I did. I don't even remember. He said, you said that Sunday, I just got me a check here. And I got a million dollar check here. And, and, and it ain't no good. That's the point he remembered. You're going to give me a check for a million dollars, it ain't no good. But one day I'm going to cash it. That's what I said. So that was a check. And I did it because I said I was tired of paying taxes. And when you finish paying your taxes and you owe some more money in taxes, and this is 97, we ain't had nothing but a house. And I said, I wrote myself a check. I said, the day has come, I'm going to have me some money. See, that's a confession. 1997. 97. 97. We started school in 1998. So 97, 07, 17, and that's 20, what, how many years is that? 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 24 years, another 24 years. <laughs> 24 years. We bought, built the first duplex on 12th Street. The next duplex was 24 years later, and Cindy would ask me, well, Pastor, what took you so long? So now I'm looking back at this check. It took me 24 years to cash that sucker. 24 years to cash it, not cash it like you thought. Now, what happened? I want to show you something. Because people will tell you this. These Christians make me get on my nerves. You know what they'll tell you? The Lord bless me. And, 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 and the Lord God gave it to me. And so you say, he did? Oh. Well, I'm just going to stand and believe. I'm going to stand and believe. Yes, God going to give God going to, yes. He's going to give it to me too. And they try to work this, what they think. God going to give it to them. God going to give it to them. God, God going to give it to them. God going to give it to them. They don't tell you what they did. They don't tell you who they talked to. They don't tell you they had to pray, not only pray, but they had to work their butt off. They don't tell you they had to go to the bank. They had to keep good books. They don't tell you they had to go and apply for a credit. They had to get the credit score up. They had the data to learn about if, you, if your credit cards are more than 25% of the, of the total amount available to you, your credit score goes to the bottom. You got a $5 credit card. You got $800 on the credit card. It sucked up your credit score. You got to get it under 25% and your credit score will go up. So, so then I'm, I said, I'm going to cash that check. Now, I miss believing that, but I forgot, I just off and on you, forget about it. This man reminded me the other day. So, in, in, when I read Rich Dad's book, I went, this is what happened. We went to Raleigh, North Carolina, to Dr. Price's uh, regional meeting at Pastor Soul's church in Raleigh, North Carolina. Pastor AJ and I went. And that often I gave $1,000. I think it was just me and Carrie, we gave $1,000. The church might have given us something. I know we gave it. No, we gave this. And so we were coming back to the airport, and I, we, you know, you got time. I went, I saw that bookstore. I said, let me go look. That's when I saw that book. Rich Dad was not popular. He had not been interviewed by Oprah. It was not on television anywhere. So I got the book, put it on my bookshelf in October. We went on vacation over in Orlando in Westgate. And that, I said, I'm going to take one or two books to read. I sat up in my bed during that Christmas week at Westgate, and I read Rich Dad's book. That, after that... I came here for New Year's Eve service, and I preached. How many of y'all remember that night? All right. Now, I preached the December 2000, what I got from Rich Dad. I read that book, 400 pages. I wrote on just about every 10 page, every other page in there. I read that book so well until I could get inside that man's mind. And I knew what he talked about based on what I gained from his book. And I felt like I knew the man. If he walked up to me today, he knows me. Well, it's just words. I ain't never seen the man face to face. But I know about him enough. He wrote enough in that book to change my life. Do you know what? He has too. 
He'll change your life. He'll change your life, my friend. He's written enough in here for you to change your life. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. But it's in the book. And so that night, uh, then I came back and preached. That was an, I, I'm going to call some names. Uh, Richard and Nautica were living on Laura, and they came down Orange Street, and they said, Pastor Laitler. And they said, that we saw some property for sale. I'm going to make it short, but I'm going to show you this. We said, now remember now, I don't, I, I'm thinking about that $1 million check, but I'm not kind of thinking, I'm, I'm thinking, but I'm not really aware of that kind of too much. So my, my wife, everybody got a check. Everybody, there's six of us with a million dollars. Ain't no good, but they, one day they're going to cash it. One day they're going to cash it, some kind of way. See, if your confession, see, one day they're going to cash them. Some kind of way. I don't know how. I can't tell you how. But one day they're going to cash them. And I ain't going to be dying either. Don't think, well, if you die, they're going to get some insurance. And I'm like, no, 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 no. He said, the law watches over his word to perform. And it's the word in your mouth that's nigh thee, in your mouth, in your heart, which you believe, which the word of faith, which we all preach. He watches over that word. So one day they're going to cash it. I don't know when I ain't interested. All I know, they got a check. So we gave them all checks. We then bought that property. Nordica, if it hadn't been with Nordica and Richard, we found it. We went. I don't know where you went. I don't know if somebody went. Uh, Nord, uh, and then Walter and Tarn Jahar, all, all of us got in trucks and cars. We went over to Orange Street. I said, this is it. So we said, all right. The next day I called the man, put a contract on it. We bought that property for 300 $75,000. Had to create a little company and put in the name of the company, Layla and Layla. And uh, I told my wife, we went to the attorney, Miller set up. He said, now, when you set up the company, you want it 50 50 uh, on the stock. You had to, have 50, you had to say, how many stocks do you want? I said, maybe 100 stocks. And he said, how do you want to divide it up? 50 uh, 50? Uh, how do you want to do it? I said, no. I said, make it 60 40. Because somebody got to make some decisions. Because, see, when you're equally 50-50 and the worst person who's 50-50 with you don't agree with you, you can't go nowhere. You're like a snake with two heads. You ain't going, you ain't going through the fence. So I said, we'll, we'll make it 60-40, and then we're going to make some decisions. We're going to make some money. So my wife said, yeah, there she is. She can speak. Yeah, she said, it. We're gonna make, we have to make some courageous and bold decisions. So we bought the property. We drew out all, all of them. We only had $60,500 in our retirement. I told you some of this. Some of this. And we went and put $50,000 down on that property and got it. Citrus and Chemical Bank loaned us the money. That was that one deal. That property, we kept that. About two years later, we cashed out $100,000. We ain't paying this money back. You know who's paying the mortgage? The people with the leases. We're providing a service. When you go to a grocery store and Publix and you buy your grocery, who gets the money out your pocket? Your Publix get the money, right? You get the product, the food, right? So when you get somebody's place, then they pay you what? The rent. You take the rent and pay the bank. So it ain't costing you nothing. So we got $100,000. About in 1987, no, 1997, some other time, 2005, so whatever it was, we went and got $200,000. Refinanced, it got $200,000 out of it. It went all the way up to $786,000. We, and $586,000, we got $586,000, and two hundred dollars of it was in our hand. We went and bought some more property with it. Yeah. See, you don't go to get your car and your coat. No, you, no, no, you don't you spend this money. You don't spend this kind of money like that. So, so that's what happened. So we just sold that, that property to this church. This church owns Matthew 26. That property on Orange Street, we sold it for $1.12 million to this church. This church has seven, twelve to $13,000 in rent coming in every month, but we got a mortgage. And guess who holds the mortgage? They're going to pay somebody. So then, there's another scripture. You find the scripture there in Luke, uh, in, uh, yeah, Matthew 25, verse 27. He says, well done. He gave out five, two, and one talents. He said, well, the five got what? Ten. The two got what? Four. But one of them said, you're an evil man. You just take where you don't put down nothing. You are hard to get along with and you're tough. He said, I'll tell you what. I'm going to judge you with your mouth. 
Your mouth is what causes the, the course of your life to turn. Your mouth. It ain't God. It's your mouth. The course of your life turns on what comes out your mouth. And he says, I'm going to judge you with what comes out of what? Your mouth. So he says now, so then why didn't you at least put my money out to who? The bankers. It's right there. Look at you. It's right there. The second line from the bottom right there. Why didn't you put my, and it, why didn't you put it out to the bankers? So that I could have had interest on my money when I returned. At least you could have done that. So, make a long story short. So he called him and said, take, the one, take it from the one who got the, the one. Take him from him, that good-for-nothing servant, and give it to the one who got ten. The disciples said, wait a minute. They already got ten. Why are you going to give them? Give, take it from that poor sucker because he was lazy and he was slothful. Faith is not for lazy folk. Faith works. And faith will work. He said, he put it, give it to the one who got the ten. And he said, because he was faithful in that, which was, he said, and, and uh, even, so then, even those which seem to have, if they're not faithful with it to try to multiply it, even that would be taken away. So you want to work to increase. God wants you to increase. He promises us that in Psalm 15. Psalm 115. I'm going to tell you this. And I was, uh, he said in Psalm 115. Psalm 115 and verse number 14. He says this. Uh, verse 12. 115, 12. He says, the Lord. Mindful of us. I take out all these helping verbs because they're not in the scripture. The Lord. Mindful of implied us. He blesses us. He blesses the house of Israel. He blesses the house of Abram. He blesses those who fear the Lord. Both small and great. The Lord increase you more and more. Your children, you and your children, you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. You know, well, may the Lord keep you. May the Lord, that's a, that's a, that's a helping verb. That has to ask permission. The Lord has already blessed us, my friend. I don't need to ask him, may the Lord don't bless, may the Lord keep you. He is keeping me. You mean to tell me I gotta ask him, may the Lord keep me? May the Lord bless me? May the Lord prosper you? May the Lord, may what? Mother, may I? No, confess the word. So we did that. Make a long story short. We ended up. Look at number one. Now look at line number four. We took this one piece of property. We just did it over and over. And uh, number one, we bought a piece of property for $375,000 from John Womack and Bertha. And that property just praised at $650,000. We took out, went to the bank, refinanced, and see what did we get from the bank? What did we walk out there with? $399,000. Y'all see it? Look at number two. The, but then we bought the piece across the street the same year, 2000. In 2001, we bought the same piece across the street. It was 230000 It just appraised as 580000 So we just refinanced and walked out the bank with what? Y'all can see it. And now you say, well, why are you telling this? I'm trying to tell you something. I won't tell you all, oh, the Lord bless you. I'm going to tell you how he did it. Because you might want to try it yourself. Or you might want to tell somebody how to do it. And just, just blind faith, crying at the altar, hoping and praying, and ain't got no strategy for God's blessing to come to you. So I'm trying to tell you, say, well, well I, I wouldn't tell that. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's, that, that, that's, that, 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 that's, that, I wouldn't tell that. That's my business. That's why you ain't got none. I'm trying to show you how you gotta have some business. What did Jesus say? He said in, in, uh, do, uh, in uh, Luke chapter 19 verse 13 so he called the ten servants delivered to them the ten minus and said unto them what? Y'all do what? But what do we specialize in? Having church. We want to have more church than we want to do business. We want to sing and shout all over the place and spit everywhere which is wonderful. We love it and praise our hands but when you finish you got to come down off the wall and go to work. You got to go to work. You got the word work. In all labor, there's profit. 
Money answers all things. Ecclesiastes. So we did that. But now, so now notice on the, and look at F7. In F7, we then, this happened Thursday, $776,000. So then we got to pay off, we pay the people we owe. So we owed somebody, look at number, uh, no, line number eight, we had paid off the 35000 that was closing costs. Then we turned around and paid off Mid-Florida, we owed them some money. You know, I learned by one month, you know what, there's a difference between asking and receiving. Okay, giving and receiving and taking and borrowing and lending and borrowing. There's a difference. They're different. It's a difference between selling something and buying something. So each, these five things, have, there's a difference in them, how you do them. So we had to pay off uh, number 10, line 10, that bank. And then we, that cost 416000 out of that money. But guess what, what what's the difference? $3,600, dollars All right, show, show, little Shayla, show slide number two. So Sister Layla and I, uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you this. Uh, I told you, this is the closing. I, you might not be able to see it. You can see it a little bit up here. You can see it better. Roll up a little bit if you, can, if you can scroll it. I hope you can. That's the money right there. And I was too, too, that's too big. We can't see the left margin. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there it is. So that's what we that's what we got out of that property on go on uh, 730. We we'll scroll it down, scroll on down. We had to pay off Mid Florida, and we walked out of there with that much money at the bottom of the page. We are not going to pay it back. We're going to serve. You know who's going to serve? Everybody who lived there. If you start serving the Lord like you serve, you're going to learn how to serve people. By serving the Lord. How do you think Aretha Franklin got great? This year? She started in church. Uh, Whitney Houston. All these people, they started in church. They learned to serve. They learned to sing. They learned to give. They learned to do these things. And they continued. Then they took their gifts to the world. But they started in the church. And the next page. So then, so then I say, oh, wow. The next one. Then here is the next one. Go on down. The next one was the same thing, and we walked out of there with a check for what? Go to check slide number three. That one, the next one shows a slide back up to the top. Well, after this one, go down to the check right there. I, see, I, I have to write this out. I have to do this. You say, well, Pastor, this is your business. It's your and Sister Lita's business. And I asked him, I said, do you think I ought to tell this? She said, well, and she asked me one or two questions about why would I say this and why would I say this? I said, well, uh, and I told her. See, it's our business. But I'm trying to help y'all. If you say it was too late for me, tell somebody. Tell our people to buy up their neighborhoods. Don't complain about the drug dealers going down on your street. Buy up them three or four houses. So we had a check. You don't see them every day. Go on to the next one. That's the same statement. Go up, go on. And after this one, go down to the check. Next. Right there. And that's the second check. And that's two pieces of property. And we cashed $360,000. Now I could go on and share with you many other things. But one thing I want to share with you on the next page. At the top up there, let me, let me go down a little further down. John Evans, in, look at line number 33. How you get out of debt, how you get out of debt is called debt, rapid debt reduction. If you have 10 bills and you owe one bill, start paying extra on one bill as much as you can. And pay that one bill until it, whichever one, no, it's not with the biggest balance. Forget the biggest balance. You get the one that has the highest interest because that's somebody else's money. You want to get out of that situation as quick as you can. So whichever, find out what the interest rate, and that pay that one off as quick as you what? Can. So then pay the high interest rate off first. Then if it's paying off $200 on that, take the, when it's paid off, then pay, take that $200 and add it to bill number two. Now bill number two, you're paying $50. Now you're going to pay $250 on this one and pay it. Then when you finish with the, 
this bill number two, you're going to take the 250 and the 50 and add it to this $25 one over here. Now you're going to pay 200 50 and 25 And you keep doing this rapid what? Debt reduction until you pay it off. You'll be out of debt before you know it. We did it three times. And each time we moved from where we were to share uh, Havenwood, and we did it when we were at Havenwood to go to uh, where we are now. That's why house don't mean nothing to you. I gotta tell you this. Because out of this money, that, that's not all the money, we got two more closings to do. So looking at, look at line, um, all these properties, if you take a look, look at number 34. Number 34 is roughly about it's worth two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Y'all see that? We owe about how much? Sixty-eight thousand. So that's a lot of money for us to get all hands on. Y'all see that? Line thirty-four. The same thing about line twenty-five. So we're gonna go and get that money right there. We're gonna get that number thirty-five, and that's gonna we gonna get that's that'll be closed in about two weeks. We're gonna have another two hundred eleven thousand dollars. So what's gonna happen? So all we can go in there and get some of this money out of here. So to make a long story short. This is not our personal stuff. This is just a business on the side. You don't see none of my personal stuff in here. Okay? So now, but the house we live in. So I asked Ms. Lacey, she said, well, is there a reason you would share this? Carrie, come up here and tell us. I asked her, she said, well, I say, uh, is there a reason you would tell this? She said, well, why would you tell this and why would you say this to the people? I said, well, you know, you, you, she'll tell you. you it'll, it'll get to pick you up from here. It'll pick you up. Can you find it back there? Well, use testing, it. testing, one, two, testing. Yeah, that's right, here's one. Okay. How do you get this one? Is that the way it works? Mm -hmm. yeah. No, that's, that's red. No, that's on. That's on. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, because um, Bishop is the, is the visionary, is the financial <laughs> visionary for our family. And I have to applaud him. He has he has had has a vision, and I don't always understand. Well, I, I didn't always understand, but now after 40 years, almost 40 years of marriage, I understand quite a bit. I have learned, so I choose not to be no SLD, no slow learner. I'm going to learn everything that I can, and I have picked up very much from him, and I appreciate him. Um, uh, however, my 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 background has took me all the way, it took me to my mom and my dad, and they had, their whole mindset was always pay, pay debt and never owe anybody, you know, and they would always pay, when, when my father passed away and he was the last one, then he had paid two years in advance uh, on, on certain things, so I had to make an adjustment, but we didn't own property. You know, uh, well, he did. We did have family property, and my dad was, uh, and my mom were paying taxes on it. But then after that, you know, after their passing and, after, and, and, and on down the line, then of course it became air property, and that, you know, we everybody got a little smidgen of, the, of that, you know. But I just thank the Lord because, um, and so when He brings things up to me, I reserve the right, I exercise the right, and I deliver the right to question. And if I bring I, it, and I always bring it to her. I he, say, what do you think about this? Exactly. Because and, it's easier to critique something than it is to create it. Mm -hmm. Now, you spend three weeks trying to create something, but you're a fool if you don't turn around and take it to somebody and say, what do you think of this? Mm -hmm. Exactly. What, give me your opinion of this. Mm -hmm. Try to shoot some holes in it and let me know what's wrong with it. Because if they love you, and they trying to, t they want to tell you, find out what's wrong with it, because they, you know, it, you do tell you what's wrong with it. That's healthy, because then when you try to implement it, it's chances are it's going to be what successful. successful. And there it in there it, uh, in that is the multitude of counsel. And so if he has created it, and then he offers to bring it, he does not. I don't. I don't have to go and say, well, honey, what are you doing? You know, I mean, he always offers. So. So what Grandma Lil said about him not wanting to be told anything is not totally true because he's asking for input. He asked for my input. And so I will just say, I will just say, you know, um, that I said, well, now, honey, what, so now what, what is the purpose when he asked, when he said, well, this, and I said, well, why would be, the, what is the, the purpose for your sharing this part or that part or whatever and about that? about the house as well as, and we're going, there's one other item on here too, but 
Uh, and I said, as, as long as, and, I, and then I understood, he shared me, and I told I said, well, as long as it's for a teaching moment, because that's what it's all about. It's a teaching moment, and it is a time where we have the opportunity to share with others and share with you. And like he was saying, it does not, it's not pie in the sky by and by coming down. It's not that at all. It has been diligence, uh, diligent working. It has been steadfastness when we were, uh, when we were refi, and every time we have refied any loan, we have always been very diligent. We keep good records. We have files that are jammed up and jelly tight. I mean, you know, his office might look like a whirlwind, <laughs> but the files that, the files that are in the office, the important papers, they are in, they are in order, and we can always go to them, we can always locate them, and we can always submit them. But I just praise the Lord because uh, it's, it's so important that we just, we learn and we know and that we have to walk by faith. And, and faith, as I was teaching this morning, is the, is the two-sided coin. And, and there is no coin that is embossed only on one side that's, that is, is, is an exchange, a means of exchange. It cannot be spent. It is counterfeit. But if, there, if you have two sides, you know, belief and faith. So you have to believe and be persuaded enough that what the Word of God says. And then that the faith part is actually putting it to work. Confessing what we want to confess, what we're believing. And then acting on it in Jesus' name. And so the house part, well, what part of it? Let me help you out. Okay, now what part of it? the question is, we got $360,000 in our hands. The most folk would say, if we, if, if the turn my, turn my mic on, please. I ain't turn nothing on. Well, oh, you got a yellow light here. Just put it there. <laughs> all right. So, what well, the question is, you when you, you all have sums of money, you say, well, I'm gonna fix up my house. I'm going to get me a living room furniture and a sofa. I'm going to get, I'm going to put something on. So look at number 47 and 48. We say, well, oh, we can pay off our house. Number, that we have a second mortgage on the house. Or we say, oh, we can get some awnings for the house. Oh, number 51 says, oh, we can get the trees all trimmed up. You go down that list of things. You got the blinds, the dishwasher, the security system, the doorbell, the furniture. Number 56, you got the gutters. The, the, car, the washing of the driveway, the paint, the interior of the house, the exterior of the house. You can take money and put in your house all day. And your house will never be perfect. Am I right? So the question is, do you want a house for your life or a life for your house? That's what the Lord gave me when I was getting ready to leave the house. Do you want a life for your house or do you want a house for your life? And I decided, we decided, we want a life. We just happen to be in a house. Amen. Amen. And all these are what we call the wish list and the American dream. And it's a, it's a scam. Home ownership is a scam because the, the more you have a house, the, and the more house you have, the more taxes you're going to be paying. The government needs it. There's nothing wrong with it now. It, it, but, but they want to sell everybody on home ownership. And the maintenance is going to be larger. And the maintenance is going to be quite right there. And I, I, I'm, we live in a nice house. But we just know our taxes are $8,600 a year. The taxes. And so the American dream. But you got to position yourself to be able to stay there. Somebody say, well, you're going to downsize? No, I ain't going to downsize. Why should we downsize? We, we, people downsize because, take me down just a little bit. <laughs> people downsize because they, uh, when they retire, they lose 80 percent of their money they retire they make a hundred percent when they retire they retire down to 20 percent of their money and then they try to that's why they're trying to live on on 20 percent of what they used to make and it's tight so when you get a piece of property you get it paid off early in your life at least you got another fit two hundred two thousand dollars on the side along with to which bring you back up to maybe 70 percent you hear what i'm sorry for if you if it's not for you please help somebody else tell them about this so it's our business. We can keep it to ourselves. It's still our business. But we're telling you, because if, if we save ourselves, then we can save the ones who will hear us. And so we, just made, and we talked about the house. We said, well, do we want to do this? We, need, we want to get. As a matter of fact, one lady gave us our family room furniture in our family room. It's been in there ever since we were over at uh, Chestnut. Chestnut. And we still got that, that old ugly furniture in that house, that new house. 
Some people tell you, well, I wouldn't take that old car to that new house. Well, that's how I got the new house, because I had the old car. <laughs> so, one more closing to do. And then look at line number, line number, well, we're going to close again. And um, on the front page, page number, line 13, we're going to close on uh, number 13. And we're going to sell, now here's, I want to say this, look at in line number 14. I asked the ministry, I put it out here, sometimes you have to be careful what you drop out, but I just, I don't care, I don't care, I, this is me. So I said, well, we want to buy this house down the street right here because we knew we had John and them coming on staff and we needed it because if you can't pay a big salary, at least you can have housing and that'll help, help staff. And I said, well, we want to get that house down there and it has four and a half lots on it. Y'all, some of y'all went crazy. We don't need to buy nothing there. We don't need to buy nothing there. We need to fix up around here. So I'm like Abraham. I said, well, that's all right. Lot, we'll leave that alone. So I left it alone. I left it alone. I was done with it. Do you know what happened? It came to me and said, buy it yourself. I hadn't thought about it. I was looking out for the church. Do y'all know I look out for the Lord's people? I look out for the Lord's the people. You got to look out for the people. You got to look out for the people. And, we, and so, so I gave up on that idea. I forgot it. And then it came up in another discussion. I said, well, well I get it. But we wasn't trying to get it. The same thing would happen. To, we weren't trying to get it. And so we got, we got it for $80,000, $82,000. At closing, we were getting ready to sign it. We had taken the four lots off because we wanted the church, that parking lot, to go all the way back down there to that, almost that road down there. It's another road that way back down there, unopened. Four more lots down there, 200 some feet down there. We got that, took off the lots, and we sold the house and got it. So now it's time. So the Lord, I've been confessing since 1997 that we were going to cash that check. And to make a long story short, we're going to, I talked to the board, we're going to buy the lots. So I could, we owe $225,000 on the building, the church here, by building. But then we're going to get those lots because that was in my heart to do that. And so we said we're going to give this money. And I asked the board would, would they, if I gave a restricted amount of money for this purpose, for a specific purpose. And the board, uh, we agreed on that. And so what we did was, the, back to that check, if you look at line number 16. Look at line 16. Yeah, I Line 16, it took, since ni that check says from 1997 until Thursday the 20, whatever that, Thursday, wasn't it Thursday? Mm -hmm. Friday. Was Friday. Friday the 21st. Mm -hmm. That check, finally, I should have said, we're going to cash this check and ain't going to owe nobody nothing. But I just said, we're going to cash the check. We, can't, we were able to, on paper, we cash the check. Because we're cashing out with what? $1,068,000. Couldn't believe it. That's how the check got cash. Took 24 years. Job said, of all my appointed time, I'm going to wait till my change comes. And I know he'll vindicate me if it takes down to the last day. You just stand on it, you just stand on it and confess it. So today, so I'm going to wrap it up. Today, Ms. Layla and I, I got that check. I forgot we even had this check back in 1997. And uh, this check is here. There's a copy of it on the screen. And here's the check for a million dollars. And that's the million right there 24 years later. And so, but remember when we, we gave $50,000 to the ministry, I said, and I got this from Dr. Price and all them faith folks. They said, you give to the, give to the Lord's work. The Lord will help you. The Lord will bless you. And I turned around and I said, we want to give. I said, I want to give, we want to give, five, we, remember MJ and his dad? We gave those two $5,000 offerings. If it, and I, I come up in that, from with him, them two, that man this morning was right over here. You can't buy no miracle, but I can show convince God I need one. And he, so I, he did them, them, and that happened, and he was here until he left at the beginning of the pandemic. And so, and so today, you know, this is with earmarked money, but to go to the next check, uh, LaShayla. The next one, so did we never, the next one, no, no, the next slide. Number four, let me see, I'll tell you what it is. 
Go to number... Five. When you find number five, so what we, we we want to do this, and I'm making this is not charitable giving to the poor. Number five, and so today, and I'm 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 happy to tell you all this, and I told you how we got this money. See, most pre people on pastors won't tell you all this because the people be jealous and they think they done stole the church money. So. <laughs> So we, we are giving $100,000 to the ministry today. And here's a check right here. I was yesterday. <laughs> yesterday, the glory is the Lord's, okay? Y'all can't see God, but you can show believe he exists when your people start doing things that prove he works. And I was on my way trying to find a cashier's check yesterday, running down, flying past Diana, Diane, Diane, Diane Robinson. She, and I was running to the credit union, got up in there, Oh, the, the cashier's check machine broke down the night before. And Diane said, You've been run, you almost run over me running down the street trying to get. I say, you're going to know why I was running to the bank when I see you tomorrow morning. So that's what we did. So I want to give this to, uh, wait a minute, but anyway, this is going to be banked. And then we're going to buy, we have a contract here. we also buying the lots. So, um, and that's earmark. So if you all got some money, you all want to earmark something, you know, of a substantial amount of money, you all want to pay off the church. $225,000, yeah, we get your name on something. <laughs> and, uh, and you can't earmark it. But don't, come, don't try to earmark $25. We're going to put $25 for the flower fund. We ain't got no flower fund. But we do have a building fund, which other than that's the only fund we have. Uh, so we want to encourage you all. I hope you all can look at that, but it's no secret what God can do. It is no secret what God can do, what he's done for others, he'll do for you. There is no sorrow, he'll pardon you. There is no secret, we raise it up a little what God can do. Here we go. There is no secret what God can do. What is done for others He'll do for you. With arms wide open He'll pardon you. There is no secret what God can do. Slow it down, not to rush. Don't rush. What I want to encourage the saints, tell your children. You say, well, my daughter got married, and so we had a piece of property that was paid off, and they gave us a moderate down payment, and we sold them a duplex. They want to get in the business. You need some extra money. If you're in portfolio money like stocks and bonds, like people work for Publix and the mines, and that's fine. But you want to just, you've got to have something. Now is a bad time to buy property because the prices are so high. But things go up and down. Remember 2008? You could buy a house for a quarter. The day is coming again. Pay your bills. Don't be late. Pay an extra $10 to $15 every time you pay somebody. Pay off your high interest rates early. And keep your credit cards under 25% of the balance. I called a credit card company. I said, listen, I want to raise my credit line. It's a $64,000 credit card. I said, I want, they said, well, I, I want you to a $100,000 credit card. They said, well, what purpose do you want it? I said, I just like the sound of it. Am I right? I said, you like the sound of it. So then they passed me over to the, to the business people who processed it on. And uh, they put me on, put on pending for three days. So I called them. I said, I've been on pending for three days. By the time we closed, you see. And I paid off the credit card, which is $45,000. Paid it off, cash. My score going to jump up. 
if you get over 25 percent on the credit card it's going to drive your school down you go for credit credit they're going to charge you more interest they're going to give you much of a hassle so i've never had an 850 credit score but i'm working we're working on it but i'm telling you how to get it so i told my i said they say well you're on pending i say well i want it they said well, for what purpose and I told them about the 25%. I said, I just found that out last month. I'm 72 years old, and I just found out that I need to keep my score under, my a balance on my credit card under 25% of the card. I said, so I want $100,000 100, on my card. He said, well, they check. Please hold. Three times they put me on hold. They're checking it out. So you be patient. There's a time to be patient. Just shut up. After you ask the question, hush. Because they're thinking. They're working it out. They say, well, we can't do all that right now, but uh, we can do 85. I say, good. I ain't never had no 85. I don't even need it. I ain't going to plan on you. It's just, it's just, but when you use it, you want to stay under 25%. I say, because we do a lot of business. And so, uh, and get a credit card that's tied to something you're going to do. Don't, don't, a cash back card is just a little bit along a lot of times. Sam got a credit card where it's a Southwest, Southwest. And so when he uses it, they all, he can get points and just fly, fly free. Well, we got a Marriott credit card from Chase through Marriott because we, get, we can go to the hotel. We go, when you go, you're going to stay in a hotel. People think I got money. think we got money. I, we, we, we do have money. See, see the law of the lid. Y'all heard it? Y'all heard the law of the lid? Because what do you say? Well, ain't got money don't grow on trees. Your subconscious mind is all evil is always what? Present. Present. It's right there. And you got to be mindful that your, the confession of your what? Faith is always at war with the law of your lid, your subconscious habit, mind, with your body. And so, uh, 85,000. So I'm going to go wait six months. I'm going to call. And then I'm going to go to 100. Then I'll be content. But I want to share this with you all. Yes, it's our business. Did we have to tell you all this? No. Now, if you look at that outline, when we close, on the bottom of the last page, or page two, We'll have $532,000 that we've never had before. Cash, a half a million dollars. What are we going to do with it? We ain't studying that house we're living in. We had to come to it. We could just fix it up and put all the notes, do stuff in there. It's crazy. You need it to keep it up, but don't go overboard with this thing about your house. And have sofas and don't want nobody to sit on them. And doors that can't nobody come in. And carpet that can't nobody walk on. You got an idle God in your house. And God said, I'm a jealous God. You should have no other gods before me. No other God before me. So that's where we are. When we close, on both these things is coming up. And we ask, what do we do with the money? We give God a hundred. And so I'm thankful to that because we confessed it since 2005. 5 to 15. 16. Yeah, 5 to, five to from 2005 to 2015. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20. 16 years. It took 16 years for, for $100,000 to show up. I didn't know how it was going to happen. But I'm telling y'all, your confession will work. And you need to say it constantly. You need to say it often, and then because you're going to start working on it. And it's going to be working, and as you're working, it'll show up when you least expect it. Amen? Please stand to your feet. It is no secret what God can do. At your level, it's just what is done for others. Let's worship the Lord. He'll do for you Ooh. with arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do. He wants to heal you. It is no secret what God hallelujah, can do, what he's done for us. Point at somebody. 
he'll do for you and you and you with arms wide open he'll pardon you it is no secret what God can do I want to encourage you saints it's not in the color of your skin that these uh, this is a uh, critical theory of people trying to make it about the color of your skin. And they would say, well, critical race theory says we want everybody to have the same thing. Equal is equity. We want everybody to have the same thing, whether they work for it or not. We all should have the same thing. It's communism. It's Marxism. For somebody to work hard and somebody else don't work at all, but the, the, the philosophy is that everybody has the same thing. That's not right. Don't fight. You've got to fight that thing. With, it's free. It's free. It's not. It's communism. I'll show you one more. Look at line number. Keep on. John, thank you so much. Keep on. Um, we put in there a number. Um, we put in here number 25. If you look at line 25. Line 25 says we put Philip Walker in here. Phil is running for office. And uh, I, I, Claude, Dr. Claude Anderson says, listen, says, if you, black communities, black people, we don't have an economic base in our community because we don't have any businesses. Y'all pray, pray for minorities, businesses. And because we don't have any businesses, we don't have a reason to do any advertising. Because we don't have any reason to do any advertising, we don't have no radio stations and TVs. Because radio stations and TVs run on advertising. So we don't have no businesses. We don't need advertising. And we don't have no media. He said, but I'll tell you what you do. You, can either, if you need to help your politicians get elected. He said, if you, how you do that, you can buy you a politician. You can buy them. You give them some money to help them get elected. They're going to remember you when they get in office. Remember Joseph? In Potiphar's house? He was on, the Lord blessed him to get that position. But somebody in Egypt helped him get to that position. And I bet he remembered them. But them brothers are his who didn't help him at all. So he said, buy you a politician. If you don't have enough money to buy you a politician, then rent you one. <laughs> In other words, give to the campaign because help them for a season, I'm, I'm going to rent you. And so when I, when I need somebody, I know I got somebody. I, I, I rented me a politician. He said, if you can't rent one, lease one. Lease one. What are you telling me? Listen, I'm, talk, I'm teaching this morning. See, see, that's what the Lord telling her. But what I'm telling you, didn't I, hey, didn't I just tell y'all that Claude Anderson, the consultant, Listen, I'm so he said, rent one, buy one, lease one. Well, the point I'm making is this. You need to help people, a good man, get elected. So when you take your hips downtown, and you know you ain't giving them a dime, and you want all of the favor in the world, and you give them hell, trying to get where he's going. So we put it in there, we're going to help that man. So I'm telling you all that so you can spread that too. I hope you understand where I'm coming from. But he said, but what I'm saying is when you use the word, you buy your one, you rent your one, you lease one, what you're doing is favor. Because you're getting the attention of a person that if I ever need you, I, I believe you'll help me. That's what we all do. I hope you all understand that. Now them little, them little, them little souls, those tender souls, talking about we don't buy them, you do. You buy, you rent, you lease, you give, okay? You do TVs and everything else. And if you don't think these politicians can be bought, some of them can be. 
he's not bought because he's a man of faith. But you do contribute. Uh, Y'all ain't going to take over my service. I know I'm, I'm still in charge here. <laughs> but the man is running, am I right? What, what position are you running for, brother? I'll see District 40, okay? And the maximum you can get, yeah, the, the, the point is, that's right. You have to, have, you have to vote. And there's a is Yeah. Well, that's all right. I ain't worried about that. They're going to they gonna take it anywhere at all. I'm still got it. I still got it. I, I bind up. They ain't no take it out. They're going to take it one way or the other. But I'm giving it where I want it to go. I'm, I'm still giving it as the Lord gave it to me, and that's it. So help the man and vote for the man, and you do have to have favor with people. And when you go in the office and you see somebody look like you, you say, oh, it's, it's a different feeling you get. Because you know somebody can identify with you. That's what I'm talking about. So the, they gonna always going to, people going to, the world going to say anything they want to. I ain't living for the world. We ain't in the world, but we're not of it. Amen. It is no secret what God can do. What is done for others. Mrs. Mary. Do for you with arms wide open, he'll pardon you. Yeah. Mary Goodman, please come down here. I called you. So, so, Sam is holding up the church. Thank you, ma'am. There is no secret. What God can do, what is done for us, He'll do for you. Raise your hand. With arms wide open, He'll pardon you. It is no secret. What God do. One other thing. Y'all hold it down back there. They trying to they want to lay hands on it. They want it to happen for them. They want to lay hands on that money. Well, let me let me share with you something. Lay hands on it if you have you want to make your confession. It happened again, Pastor Camilla. I'm gonna say it. Come up here, Pastor. It happened again. Pastor Camilla. Uh, Rudy, I went and prayed over that property in 1984. 1984, come on on this side over here. And uh, we prayed over the lot. And uh, I did not know. And that, they lived there. How many years you lived there? And then you 25. built 25 years. And so, just to make a long story short, you, you want to see, eventually we're going to sell the property to clear up some things and clean up some things. And uh, we the property was going to go on the market and was going to be listed on the market for some amount I told her 150 whatever it was going to be do you know what happened do you know what happened you saw it helping folks start helping people so I, was, I said we'll manage your house for you and so forth and so it came up for sale and tell them what happened well the end part how did this come up where's the green light there it is Praise the Lord. Some of you may know I'm a very quiet person. I keep things to myself. And I know You're Pastor, the white one now. Pastor's always, <laughs> he's always saying, stop keeping things to yourself. He says, you got to put it out there so you, you know, get an agreement, have other people get an agreement in prayer for you. And so uh, it, it happened one morning and I, we talked about managing the house because I was tired of being a landlord. <laughs> I had to run check this out and run check that out. And I know Rudy was ready to give it up one time. And um, so I said, I'll hang on to it for a while. But I, I kind of like had to pray about it. And I was like, I'm done now. I'm tired, you know. And then with COVID coming, you had, I, I had a couple of tenants, you know, they had sickness, illness, and they, the rent backed up, the mortgage backed up, you know. So I found them trying to take care of two houses. And I said, Lord, this is really too much for me, you know. And... 
pastor called. We were something. I don't know. We were sharing about the house. And he said. I know I called you and said, how you doing? How you doing? Uh, and, and it was like. <laughs> no, no. He how said, you how doing? you doing? He said, how's everything going with the house on Providence Road? And I said, oh. <laughs> he said, what do you mean by that? And I said, just a few challenges right now. I said, but. It, it, it's a lot, and I've kind of prayed about it, but I'm ready to just, you know, put it on the market and sell it. And he said, do you have any ties or sentimental ties to the house? You know, like, I don't want to give up. And I know he did bless the house. We were up in New York. He did it. We weren't even here. So I know God had ordained this to happen. I just never thought it was going to be Pastor Layton, Pastor Carey. I, I, I just never thought. And... I just began to pray. He said, well, okay. He said, we'll work. But anyway, he was able to get hold of somebody. She said, I'll put it up on the market for you. In two days, there was a contract on the house. It was two days. And I said, oh, God. And it was candy package. She said, well, I'm coming over to the house and take pictures and everything. So all this was just happening so fast for me because I hadn't expected it. And um, in a matter of... Two weeks, I, I wouldn't say, it was two weeks the house was sold. There were two contracts on it. The amount that they set the house at, someone went above that amount. Go and be specific. You can tell I'm, it. I'm going to get there. Somebody went over. She says, well, there's two contracts. I says, all right. She said, I'm not taking no more. And she said, someone went above the amount that we had set. And I was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and when I found out who it was, I just cried. I jumped. It was Pastor Layland, Pastor Carey had put a bid on the house and they got it. All I could do was cry. I cried. I, I said, God, I got on my knees. I laid out prostrate and I said, God, I thank you. I know this is you because it, the way it happened, the connection that was there and it was lined up between Bishop, Candy Packett, and Miller Title Company, and they took care of a couple of other things for me, and they just wiped it all clean. It was the hand of God on this situation in a matter of two weeks when that house was sold. And when I found out, I, I just thanked him. I said, you know what? God knew, but I'm, and he, he says, well, you, you know, you can't keep things to yourself, and I'm trying to do this, you know, and it's, it's different when you have a spouse there with you, but when you're by yourself having to kind of coordinate all these things, it can be challenging. But I know that God is my father. He has been faithful to me. He has carried me the past four years since my husband's passed. And I just thank God today. I thank God for Pastor Layla and Pastor Carrie because when we first came down from New York in 1982, to see him, and it's like the Lord directed us to First Two Institutional Baptist Church, and he just happened to be ministering. And from that point, it just seemed like we we came down. We had to find him. We searched throughout Lakeland. We found out that they were in their house. We went to the house, and it's it's all been a journey. It's been a faithful a journey, yeah. journey, and I just thank God for the word that they have put out over us through the years through the years we've grown we've seen God do great things and so I just want to encourage you today no matter what you're going through don't give up trust God stand on his word but they have been faithful because when I found out I was like oh my God and I says Lord I don't understand it but it's not meant for me to understand everything but they were there when I needed. And I thank God for them, for the faithfulness, the seeds that they've sown in our lives over the years. And I know my husband's in agreement with me. Amen. Amen. I know he's in agreement. Because I could see he was rejoicing too. Yes. He didn't yes. want me to take on too much. And when it came to time, I was like, I don't like to bother people. I need you to fix this, you know. So I paid money to have people come and I get a call you know this is gone i'm like oh dear i'm about done with this <laughs> i'm about done with this so but god is good and i just thank him and praise him and i told him i said listen i'm not a, a person that just 
I just don't share my information now. I know y'all are just fake. I'm not there, but I do think I wanted to thank them publicly. Just didn't know when, oh. but this is God's timing. This was God's timing because I, I know pastor don't hold anything, <laughs> but I do thank you and I praise you for all. Yes, yes. And, and another thing that was going on, and this is where his heart is, the tenant that was there, that is there now, moved in in February of 2020. And her, she was going through a lot of deaths because of COVID in her family. She was just renting and she says, I don't know where I'm going to go. I went over there. She said, I don't know what I'm going to do and where I'm going to go because I just have this house through February. And I may have to look for another apartment because she said, I know that you're selling the house. I says, yes. And I know she wished her credit wasn't there, so she knew it was going to be a challenge. But she said, I, I said, my prayer is for you that God's will be done for your life. Don't give up hope trust God and she started crying and she had about four deaths in a matter of two weeks in her household and and I know where her heart was at and so she said well I just hope you I don't have to move I says well um, Mr. Laidla is is managing the house right now so and I in my spirit one morning I woke up I said God you were speaking to Bishop Laidl about this. And he may have said something that I don't want them to have to move because they loved the house. They had settled in. And she said, we just love it here. We don't want to move. And she had two, one or two children. And so the spirit, I believe, the spirit of God spoke to you. So I know what God, you know, God, you can see it, the hand of God was on this whole situation. It was a blessing to me and a blessing to this young lady. Because I think she even called you after and said, I, I just need some spiritual counseling, yes. somebody to talk to because all these deaths. And then I don't think she called it, but, um, yeah. but God is good. He's faithful. So I just thank God for all that he's done in my life and what he's going to continue to do in your life. Just trust him. Trust in God. Stand on his word. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So you, I didn't know you wanted to do this until you just told me. See what happened. I said, now God, why are you hiding from me? <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. So we're going to dismiss. And thank you, Pastor. Thank you. As a matter of fact, I'm going to ask you to pray and dismiss the, the fellowship. It's back on. Back on. Oh, it comes on later. Okay, there you go. Hallelujah. Let us bow our heads. Eternal God and Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this wonderful day that you have made for us, Lord God. And we just give you praise, glory, and honor for the word that has gone forth this morning, Lord God. We thank you that it accomplished all that it was sent to do in each and every one of the lives of the, under the sound of Bishop's voice this morning. We thank you for your love, for your kindness, for your mercies that are new every day. We thank you, Lord, while we don't always understand everything that goes on in life, we have to trust you and look with our spiritual eyes and see the work that you're doing in our lives. I give you praise, glory, and honor for being able to serve in this ministry over 30 years, Lord. I thank you for my steadfastness in the name of Jesus. We pray for each and every one of us here this evening, this afternoon, Lord God, that you would allow us to arrive at our destinations, Lord, safely, Lord God. And Father, continue to look to you because you are the author and finisher of our faith, that you are the creator of all things, and that your Holy Spirit lives and dwells in us, Lord, to lead us and guide us and direct us in every area of our lives. We thank you for the blessings from Bishop and Pastor Carrie this morning to the ministry. We thank you for the wisdom the understanding, the knowledge that you've provided them over the years to do what they're doing for this ministry. We thank you for their heart. It's not about them, but it's for the people of God, for the kingdom of God, so that the gospel of Lord and Jesus Christ will go forward. We give you praise, glory, and honor, and we pray blessings upon each and every one here this morning or afternoon who are watching by way of internet and those who are here in the sanctuary. 
be healed, be delivered, be set free. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Have a good day, and you're dismissed. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, Amen.